There is much to discuss, so let's get to our panel. Joining me now from Hong Kong is Yoshikazu Kato. He's an adjunct associate professor at the University of Hong Kong. With us from Boston is Myung Ku Kang. He is a professor of political science at Baruch College, and he is an expert on Korean political issues. With me here in the studio is Mindy Cutler. She is the founder and director of Asia Policy Point. And with us, too, is Song Zhang. He is chief correspondent in Washington for Shanghai Wenhui Daily. Welcome to all of you. Myung Ku Kang, let me start with you. From South Korea's view, why has this feud erupted uh, and blown up over the last few months, and how serious is it? So from South Korean uh, people's and government point of view, basically it happens, Japanese government has not genuinely apologized its past wrongdoings happen, especially during the Pacific War period. So the South Korean Supreme Court made a final verdict that individual level uh, compensation has not been made, especially in you know, a forced labor, those people who served for the Japanese companies. So individual level sue against individual in you know, private Japanese companies located in South Korea. So the South Korean uh, Supreme Court and people's you know, point of view is that human rights violations happened during the Pacific War period and colonial period, of course, but at the same time, many wrongdoings has not been properly apologized by the Japanese government. And then it's, uh, but in return for South Korean Supreme Court in a verdict, as we know well, as the report you know, pointed out, Japanese government used you know, trade sanctions or some economic you know, sanctions against the Korean, uh, uh, against South Korea. So the, from the Korean people's point of view, overall, uh, Japanese government measure, retaliatory measure is very unfair and then it is uh, unjust measures. Uh, Myung Koo Kang, we're talking about things that happened a long time ago. Why is it coming out into the open now? Why are we seeing these hostilities between these two countries at this time? Uh, not at this time. In fact, if you go back to this you know, legal lawsuit, mm -hmm. uh, actually, originally four Korean people who served for the Nippon Steel, they sued against the Nippon Steel in 1997 to the Japanese court. And in 2003, Japanese Supreme Court made a final decision in the compensation period has expired. And then those four Korean people you know, sued the Japanese companies, Nippon Steel, to the Korean court. And it happened in 2005. And the final decision made, final verdict made last year. So it took uh, almost you know, 13 years. If we took uh, you know, all these periods, it took more than 20 years to get a final verdict, and then once the final verdict is out, the current conflict has been escalated into you know, ongoing, really bad situation, yes. All right, let me bring in Yoshi, he's in Hong Kong. Yoshi, we've seen lots of protests in South Korea, uh, including a consumer boycott of uh, Japanese goods. What is the Japanese view of what's happening right now? Uh, of course, now, uh, Japan-South Korea relation is entering maybe the one of the most serious situations since the establishment of diplomatic ties. And I think this is the most of Japanese view. So now we need to carefully manage it. And of course, the trigger uh, could be said it's kind of history. And, you know, and J Japanese government uh, say this is all about 1965 treaty. And in fact, the Japanese government officially apologized and provided compensations to, uh, to, to things during, during the uh, World War II. Uh, but you know, this is uh, one thing. Maybe from the other hand, you know, the, the people's perception in the South Korea, uh, this is kind of different. So this, 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 it's, it's very much necessary for two countries to manage uh, the people's anger. Uh, carefully, uh, but now you know the very the things is getting more complicated because now the trade dispute between two countries and now the geosomia the, the shared mi military intelligence uh, this is a very important uh, framework for uh, two countries and including as two allies of the United States in this region to tackle the very you know serious and dangerous uh, situation including the North Koreans uh, nuclear issues so I think now the things is getting very much complicated and entering the one of the worst a situation since the establishment of diplomatic ties. So I think now, uh, now the two governments uh, need to uh, 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 at least need to maintain the communication, and you know from the two sides and in civil societies, we need to raise up some uh, healthy voices to maintain this very inter very important relations.
Mindy, as we've, as we've just heard, it's a complicated situation, yeah. and these two countries are going through a very rough period insofar as their bilateral relations are concerned. Uh, what do you make of what's happening? I take a slightly different view than from what we've heard so far. This uh, historical dispute has been ongoing for, as the professor said, many years. And, but however, it has popped up again at a time that is great service to Prime Minister Abe. He needs to revise history to what he believes to revise the Constitution. He needs to also show that he has some foreign policy wins. If you look at what he has done more closely with the Koreans, it really is more obstructionist, more annoying, more inconvenient because the as far as the, they call it the white nation list, which should tell you something right then and there, mm -hmm. um, it's just another form to fill out, which tends to be going very quickly. So it's more of an inconvenience. The Gisomia, they didn't have a Gisomia until a few years ago, and that can be, it's, that can be taken care of in other ways through the United States. They just had, the Koreans just did an agreement with Thailand. Mm. Um, so it, it, this historical dispute helps the domestic politics of both countries, and particularly for Abe, and he wants to create a situation where he can show that he has a win. And um, I think you're going to see it de-escalate quite soon. There's going to be a cabinet a shuffle and changes. Right. Yoshi, what do you make of that? Is this about domestic Japanese politics? Uh, of course, you know, uh, it's undeniable fact. I think that the Abe administration is relatively conservative. And even your know, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, uh, he's a kind of nationalist. So I think now a kind of anti-Korean approach is a, a very much popular in the public opinion in Japan. So, you know, maybe the Shinzo Abe is trying to take advantage of this, you know, atmosphere in domestic. And actually, this is uh, relatively good for his approval of the cabinet. So this is one thing. May, but maybe from the Japanese point of view, now the Korean side, the Moon Jae-in administration, actually, you know, you know, he's taking, you know, more, you know, aggressive and stronger uh, position and policies on the historical issues compared to his prede predecessor. So I think now domestic issues, uh, domestic politics uh, looks like very much matter. It's quite important and even a kind of origin of the current conflicts. So, you know, it's our diplomatic relationship is getting more complicated because of this domestic uh, politics and right. uh, inward looking policies, particularly over the historic I, issues. I think Abe was quite surprised how well the anti Korean um, tack that he took uh, proceeded. I think he was surprised how popular it was and how he scratched uh, a, a common. Uh, uh, basically racist beliefs in Japan and he has to be very careful how he manages this domestically and in many respects it's more of a domestic issue than an international issue I think the the Japanese uh, businesses understand how important it is and will try to take steps to resolve it what Japan has always failed to do is actually give the proper kinds of apologies, the legalistic kind of apologies that are needed, and to set up a mechanism that understands the issues of reconciliation and, more important, the process of reconciliation. And they have not ever done that. And this is actually presenting an opportunity that that can be created. Song Zheng, uh, we have, of course, the big power in the region, that is China. Both these countries, South Korea and Japan, are neighbors of China. Uh, how is Beijing viewing this spat between South Korea and Japan? I think Beijing is uh, watching this issue very closely, and uh, they are getting very worried. And as you said, uh, we are three uh, major countries in Northeastern Asia, but also China is the biggest, largest uh, trade partner of Japan and South Korea at the same time. And uh, at this, uh, at, uh, I think the timing is very sensitive for China also because we are seeing uh, Trump's uh, administration kind of uh, growing uh, isolation and protectionism in trade and others. And uh, I think China believes in the future this globalization will be facing tremendous challenge. And one way to, uh, for China to go out, to move ahead, is to work together with Japan and Korea to. Um, 
establish regional uh, economic and trade uh, relationship. So uh, Japan and Korea are fighting at this moment. It will uh, not only, uh, I think, uh, in, yeah. Uh, kind of affect the uh, global supply chain, but especially it will be affecting China's uh, trade strategy and economic uh, strategy in the future. So it would be fair to say then that China would also like to see a very quick de-escalation. Definitely, but uh, I, I think that other panelists are right. Mm, yeah. uh, we don't see any uh, possibility of uh, de-escalization uh, in the coming few weeks. All right, let me go back to uh, Myung Koo Kang. Uh, Japan, Myung Koo Kang, uh, recently dropped South Korea from, we heard that in our report as well, from from its whitelist. Uh, I mean, this, these are countries with which Japan has a uh, preferential trade status. How will that impact South Korea? So far, it has been really bad. And from a short-term point of view, those you know, three critical uh, chemicals, which mm -hmm. was uh, rigorously uh, reviewed, screened by the Japanese government, is very critical for producing semiconductors. And a semiconductor is a very important industry to the Korean economy. And also uh, displays, you know, smartphone displays and then smart TV displays is also a big business in South Korea. And the South Korean, you know, major big companies in you know, the dependence on the Japanese, all these you know, critical chemicals is more than 90%. So it's a very critical measure to the South Korean industry. So far, uh, from a you know short-term point of view, it has a, a definitely very you know devastating you know really uh, devastating effect. But right now, the Korean government and all those Korean big businesses have mm -hmm. tried to diversify the sources of critical chemicals and even developing you know indigenous you know sources and indigenous technology to replace you know Japanese import. So from a longer term point of view, I think this conflict can be a kind of disguised blessing to the Korean industry. By the way, going back to these domestic factors, you know, in, in Japan, yeah. let me point out that uh, the growing ultra you know, conservatism or ultra nationalism as a consequence of two decades of deflation in Japan needs to be more seriously taken into account in this context because if we look at you know Abe administration, Abe cabinet, more than half of you know cabinet members are the member of you know Japan Kaigi. Japan Kaigi or Nihon Kaigi is famous for uh, you know uh, reminding the pre World War II Japanese militarism. For instance, strong army and the rich nation was the slogan of Meiji Ishin mm -hmm. of the late 19th century. Based on that slogan, Japan built you know militarism during. You know, in the early 20th century, you know, Nippon Kaigi members, especially denying the, the validity of the peace constitution and U.S. occupation after World War II. So, in that sense, you know, this, you know, ultra the rise of ultra conservatism in Japan should be should be taken quite more seriously. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I, as I said, I disagree a little bit. I think that the conflict is going to have to wind down sooner because the history between Japan and Korea is not limited to the history between Japan and Korea. What Japan did in terms of slave or forced or constricted labor also was throughout Asia and it included Americans and it included Australians and British and people from Malta and Argentina and Saudi Arabia. And in fact, this week visiting Japan are eight children of uh, eight former POWs who were used as slave labor who worked alongside uh, Korean forced laborers. So the, if Japan keeps pushing, not only does it have an economic problem on its supply chain, uh, it will also start to shine a light on all its slave labor and forced labor claims around the world, which then circles back it's in the US interest to try to figure out how to create a mechanism basically to create the legal peace. Yep. The Japanese don't want to be sued anymore. And that's what we did with the Germans in 2000. OK, and Yoshi, what is the Japanese view on this? Uh, is there much support for the kind of ultra-nationalism that we heard about, or ultra-conservatism that uh, Myo Kong Kang talked about? Uh, of course, you know, Japan is a democratic country. You know, our public opinion, including in the cabinet, you know, it's very much you know, diversified, even divided. But you know, our Japanese government, you know, our, I mean, central government, our view is quite clear, and we are very much sure. And, and as a Japanese constituency, you know, Japan could not 
uh, established a good relation with neighbors and international community without, you know, facing to the history sincerely. Uh, this is, you know, this has been the fact and reality. So I think uh, most of the Japanese uh, make sure, you know, quite know, you know, this is how the history is important for Japanese diplomacy and economic relation with neighbors, including South Korea and China, is quite important. Uh, but now maybe, you know, back to the, the trade issue, I mean, the white face, why Japan, you know, removed the whole South Korea from the white face? I think, yeah. of course, you know, some technical issue, you know, Japan need to improve our, you know, export control and some national security concerns as, you know, Korean commenter says. But I think that the most important thing now is trust. As um, our foreign minister, Kono Taro, said, I think all about trust in, in to some extent. How to uh, recreate the mutual trust, uh, you know, beyond these histo historic issues and, you know, uh, maintaining some communication to uh, recreate this trust mechanism. I think this is the most important for Japan-South Korea relationship. Of course, you know, for the Japanese side, it's quite sure how the historic issues in, is important. And, you know, trade issues, you know, it's quite important for regional prosperity. And now we need to push forward our, you know, FTA among Japan, China, China and South Korea and RCEP, you know, and, and our three countries. Yeah, it's indis indispensable yeah. for regional, you know, stability and prosperity. So we are quite sure, but, you know, it maybe it takes some time and process. Yeah, but, yeah, I would add, uh, I don't think, uh, uh, Abe's uh, strategy to use this economic trade and uh, this technology as a leverage, as a car to play against the uh, Korean side is a good idea because whenever you play uh, this kind of car, you may permanently lose it, just like what is happening between U.S. and China. Right. President Trump believes by targeting China with tariff and others, yeah. uh, it, it is going to win. I think uh, definitely China will lose uh, yeah. on this perspective, but uh, I, I think U.S. is going, going to lose All maybe right, in the future. I, if I, I do think yeah. Abe has overplayed his hand mm -hmm. on this, and that's why he's going to change the foreign minister. That's why he just changed the head of the Asia division in the, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, why uh, it, it, he says that he won't, he doesn't want to resolve it, but that's usually a, a sign that he getting ready to resolve. All right. And Song, uh, if we look at the trade between these two countries, uh, South Korea and Japan, $85 billion a year. Mm -hmm. If this continues, mm -hmm. are these countries going to damage each other? I, I don't think that, that that will be that serious. But yeah. uh, the, the trade between Korea and Japan is not only limited between these two countries. It is, it, it is a part of the global supply yeah. chain. And uh, a lot of uh, supplies goes from Japan to Korea to China to America. So, so it is going to have a global kind of effect. I, I think these two countries need to realize how serious, serious this is going to have. I think they, they need to figure, figure that out. Right, and Mindy, talking about America, the US, of course, has a close interest in both these yes, countries. These are both treaty allies. Well, uh, it's more States. than treaty allies. Yeah. We condone the United States mm -hmm. when Japan took over, annexed Korea. We were. We didn't say no. We helped, in some respects, negotiate that. In World War II, uh, we, we didn't uh, really designate what to happen with Korea. We simply drew a line. Uh, and with the 1965 treaty, we were intimately involved in the creation of that treaty because we wanted it to mirror the 1952 San Francisco Treaty, where there were no individual claims, because if that was allowed, we would have had to backtrack and, and compensate many people. Right, so the question that arises now, Mindy, is what role, if any, can this administration play in resolving these tensions? Well, I think that the United States has to not just sit down Korea and Japan, but they have to sit down again, sort of like the San Francisco Peace Treaty, the, all the people involved, because they were all mistreated and never got a full correct apology. And in fact, Abe has completely retreated on the apology and create a mechanism like they did with the German slave labor claims to incorporate government and yeah. industry to deal with this question and then put the question, the history questions aside so they can be, other issues can be moved on because Abe is getting too much traction politically with them. Yoshi, you mentioned earlier on that uh, there are questions of trust and security. Now, South Korea has decided to abandon an intelligence uh, sharing pact that it had with Japan. Uh, what are the regional security implications of that? Uh, you know, as an uh, allies uh, of the United, United States uh, in this region, uh, Japan, South Korea, you know, we have shared the common interests and strategic concerns 
including you know the North Korea and the rise of China, you know it, it should be very much you know stable. But you know an intelligence you know mechanism, of course this has you know developed over the time. But now uh, the Korean side is unilaterally abandoned. I, of course you know it's it's very you know regrettable and even unacceptable for Japan. But you know as you said in, in terms of implications, I think first of all it's a uh, North North Korea issues. Uh, of course you know we have shared some information, military information. Some some information have been provided by the United States, but some. Some information has has been shared by you know between U.S. Uh, Japan and South Korea. So you know this is you know it, it's completely negative impact, and it, it's 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 not very very much you know uh, profitable for you know, maintaining this regional stability, including how to tackle the North Korea's nuclear threat. So I think you know this is a again this is a kind of trust. You know if we if we are lack of trust, you know this kind of you know very you know negative you know phenomena uh, could be happened. So I think you know. Uh, of course, obviously, uh, it's a very, very much negative. But you know, now, uh, Japanese government is trying to reestablish, uh, at least maintain the diplomatic communication, and if possible, uh, we, we want to, you know, recreate this in you know, a more you know, trustful relation with South Korea. So this is very right. much important for East Asia. Okay, Myung Kook Hang, I'll get to you in a moment. Um, we're listening to some of the rhetoric coming out of South Korea from President Moon Jae-in. He's talked about a quote. New Korean Peninsula. He's also talked about a peace economy. He's met with the DPRK leader, the North Korean leader Kim Jong Un. Mm -hmm. uh, will these tensions have an impact on these efforts to denuclearize the peninsula? It's at the moment it's a little bit tricky to estimate, but at least we need uh, at least in a strong triple alliance between the United States, South Korea, and Japan, along with you know uh, China. Such kind of uh, multilateral cooperation in dealing with North Korean nuclear issue is very critical. So ongoing conflict between you know, South Korea and Japan might be negative in resolving the nuclear issue going on in North Korea. But let me add that you know, in terms of trust you know, or diplomatic measures, in fact, South Korean government suggests to the Japanese government that let's allow you know, private companies donate you know, money voluntarily yeah. Both sides, you know, South Korean side and the Japanese side. Yeah. For example, in South Korean side, POSCO, which is you know steel company, which she got a lot of benefit as a result of 1965, you know, South Korea Japan yeah. agreement. So the POSCO can donate, you yeah. know, voluntarily money for those people, you know, forced labor. Yeah. And then the Japanese you know, companies involving in this you know, forced labor, they can right. donate voluntarily, and then they create you know mutual fund, you know, to resolve the situation. But the Japanese government rejected that idea. So I think those, you know, these two governments need to sit down and talk about a okay. little bit more constructive, you know, measures. Okay, Yoshi, I, I want to get your view on that, Yoshi. We have a little time left, but first, uh, well, Mindy, you wanted to say something. I just yeah. want to say we have two very different alliances with the Japanese versus the Koreans. Yeah. Koreans, we fight together, we're coordinated, we bleed together. Yeah. The Japanese, it's very separate. Right. And it will be separate unless they change the constitution, but that is again fraught with what this history. Yeah. And also Japan wants to re reclaim its glorious past, right. while the Koreans want to also reclaim its glorious past, but as one country. Okay. Yoshi, uh, I want you to get your uh, view on what you heard about those proposals that uh, Myung-Ku Kang talked about. Uh, yes, uh, I, I, I basically agree. You know, now Japan South Korea, you know, relationship uh, is you know facing very you know critical you know moment. And you know, some you know you know uh, both Japan and China, uh, Japan South Korea, we you know we agree, we disagree, and reject. Right. You know, we have a lot of issues, right? So, but now I think the the most important thing is you know we need to re-establish this, this diplomatic. Uh, right. Communication mechanism. Otherwise, you know, nothing could be happened. Okay. Right. So uh, this, uh, we are very much sure it's a quite important relation uh, for this uh, regional stability and prosperity. Right. So now we need to sit down and talk yeah. very critical issues. Yes. Right. We are going to have to leave it there. We've run out of time. Thanks to all of you for being with us. We're going to have to leave it there. It's been a great discussion. Thanks for being with us.